For those of us who live on the cliffs of not making rent, side hustle professionals while watching our brown faces and the faces of brown children we want nothing more than to protect, be sold to white funders for the paycheck and conscience of people who refuse to even see us. And even despite this, we hashtag love our jobs, stay up late talking brilliant young people from ledges, come up with reasons to talk ourselves from ledges, while directors, board members, institutional staff, white supremacy parish members sleep soundly to the tune of six-figure salaries and clout lullabies and their beautiful families that they have the choice to make. Say, come up with reasons to talk ourselves from ledges. Today, I offered my formal resignation with six weeks notice. I wouldn't be working with this organization today if I hadn't been a student of the organization's programs myself. I have always been proud to say that my arts journey and later my career all started in this organization's art programs at 16 years old. I have gained lifelong mentors and my access to arts programming in high school has radically shifted my life path for the better. There is no denying the power of arts education and this organization's very specific and unique impact on my life. I'm grateful for the opportunity to have grown my skill set here for the past six years. I have been fortunate to have held a position that doesn't usually exist in a nonprofit, but I am no longer able to grow in my position here. I have hit a ceiling in developing my skills and truly being able to express my creativity through my media work and it's time for me to develop my personal vision outside of the confines of the nonprofit structure. The decision to leave is one that I've been thinking about for many months, and the current state of the organization has increased my sense of urgency to step away. Furthermore, I see that the current vision, values, and strategic direction of the organization have drifted away from the organization I found myself so proud to be a part of six years ago. I believe deeply in the mission, vision, and day-to-day -day work of the organization. However, I see a fundamental difference in how each of us as individuals want to see the mission demonstrated and how the executive director and the board want to embody the mission. The fearless leaders, unnamed, whom I saw fighting to shape a new equitable structure for programs, a structure that I fully supported, were removed from the organization. How we have moved forward since then has shown me that the hard work needed to work toward an equitable interpretation of the mission, shaped by the most impacted staff, is not going to happen. And it's devastating that the board is giving staff and teaching artists an ultimatum to accept their definition of the mission or to walk. It should be alarming that I'm leaving an organization I once loved deeply and felt so valued and cared for in because it has deteriorated into a space where I feel disposable, devalued, and underappreciated for my work. It should be alarming that staff members have voiced that they feel shut down, unsupported, and afraid of retaliation for speaking up. It should be alarming that every red flag raised by myself and others has felt largely unseen and unheard. I have always done and will continue to do my work with the highest integrity. My last day will be September 11, 2019, just short of my sixth year anniversary working here. Eight plus years if I count my time spent as a student in the programs. As for what's next, 
I am permanently leaving the nonprofit industrial complex to embark on a full-time path of freelance media production and artistic rediscovery. Our city is rife with artistic resources, and I plan to take advantage of every opportunity to finally flourish holistically as an artist. I plan to work specifically to elevate the stories, visuals, and narratives of youth, women, BIPOC, and other multiply marginalized identities in our community. And that's what I'm doing. My name is Amy Pignon, she, her pronouns. I'm a filmmaker, photographer, vocalist, creative person. I am a former employee at a nonprofit. I was a board president at another nonprofit. Most of my work history is with nonprofits, but now I'm completely outside of it. After I left the nonprofit sector, I started hearing so many more stories of people leaving under similar circumstances. I think pretty much every story I've heard revolves around the same thing. There are equity issues in the organization. Those issues are raised by staff members. Um, the organization's leadership might respond by doing some surface level DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion training, anti-oppression training. They might hire a consultant, but nothing happens beyond talk. And those people who initially raised those issues are pushed out because they are then seen as the problem. When I announced this film, so many people reached out to me and shared their experiences. And while it can be healing for people to share their experiences with people who understand, us sharing our stories with each other in a silo is not what's driving change in the sector. That's not to say our stories aren't valuable though. I think before anything can actually change, People in positions of power need to understand how these issues actually affect people on a human level. It is not a radical idea to treat people as people with full lives outside of work who do not owe their entire life and well being to capitalist institutions. And it's also important for those who have been harmed by nonprofits or by any workplace to not only see their stories represented, but also to see how healing can happen, to see how people have moved through these experiences and continue to work within this system, but in a better way, and what that better way looks like. I'm not an expert. I don't have all the answers, but collectively, I think we do have a lot of answers. So in my opinion, I think let's stop overthinking everything and just listen to people's stories. All right, so I'll read. I'm going to read y'all two poems that I wrote that speak specifically to PWIs, um, just so I can get that energy out of here. And then I'm going to do a limpia with the poem about the ofrenda so we can cleanse the air a little bit more, right? My name is Clara Olivo. My pronouns are she, her, ella. I have worked in the nonprofit sector for over 15 years and as of 2020 have decided to no longer be exploited by the nonprofit sector. Um, so this one is called A Love Letter to the White Women at My Last and Every Job. Um, a little bit of background. So predominantly white institutions are a prevalent theme in my life. How can they not be, right? And there's something really special about the uppity white lady who wants to be all for racial equity. I worked for the largest hunger relief organization in Washington state. And I got involved for a multitude of reasons. I am a chef by trade. I 
also use my experience, my culinary experience um, within the nonprofit sector, um, working with food access, working um, with low income neighborhoods, teaching children how to eat healthy, cook healthy, and grow their own food. And combining those skills just really naturally manifested for me. Um, and so when I moved to Seattle and I decided to work at re-enter the nonprofit sector, I wanted to be able to find a role where I could balance those two passions of mine, my passion for building community through food and my passion for, you know, supporting my communities. Um, and so food is an incredible way of doing that. Food brings people together and so what better way to support those around me than to, you know, create more access to food, especially nutritious and culturally relevant foods. So my official title was food sourcing specialist, and it was my responsibility to procure produce and dairy for the 300 food banks that our organization um, oversees. And what that meant for me was to literally just go out there and build relationships within the, um, the farming community, which I was all about. My role took me on the road twice a week. I have memories where I'm driving to go meet a new donor and right next door to this new donor that I'm going to go introduce myself to and build this relationship with is a house that has like two Confederate flags, like just flying high. And I just remember holding on to the wheel and just, I just kept driving. I'm like, nope, I'm not stopping here. <laughs> like there's no way, cause like this does not go well with that, right? Um, and at no point did I ever feel safe enough to, you know, let my supervisor know like, hey, this just happened because I have a job to do. And she made it very clear to me that, you know, that's my job. My job is to go out there to, you know, represent the organization, be the face of the organization. And, you know, sometimes I'm gonna come across um, unsavory situations and, you know, I just have to, push through it, you know? Um, and so I did for a long time. To the white women at the PWIs, the ones who praised me for being courageous, heard my voice and passion with fervor and approval. You who thought the world of me said you loved me, even claimed you wouldn't let me go. It was the first time in my entire career that I had a, you know, a livable wage I had health insurance, I had dental insurance, I had vision, like all of this like amazing care that was coming to me. And it was like, again, the first time in my entire life. And so that's when I decided, okay, well, I finally have the resources and the flexibility to, to get the help that I need. And so I finally decided to find a therapist. And this was my first year with the organization. You know, fast forward, I find out that I am diagnosed with ADHD. I am diagnosed with um, general anxiety disorder and I'm diagnosed with um, major depression and CPTSD. So all of these things I am learning about from like my first few months of being with my therapist. And with that came this huge shift in my routine because I had to start taking medication for the first time. And that was a whole wild ride for me. And I was very transparent about that when it came time to um, make that shift. And I let my supervisor know because I trusted her and I felt like she cared about me. You forget I was a guest in your house, a stranger to your customs and traditions, that in fact I was not created equal and your policies and procedures were not made for me or with people like me in mind. I didn't feel like I was off track until February of 2020, <laughs> until COVID hit. <laughs> that meant less time on the road and more time in the office, which in some ways was great, <laughs> right? But in other ways was also overwhelming in that I had to be in front of a computer for eight hours straight. And I had to do that Monday through Friday, which I know for some people like that is their normal. But for me, that was so outside of what I am 
used to and what I am capable of really and truly. And I didn't know that then. I didn't understand that then. I ended up getting put on a performance improvement plan, a PIP. And so the whole purpose of the performance improvement plan was for me to get that contract, for me to fix the problem, which was me. Um, and so in the PIP, it basically outlines what I need to be doing every day of the week, basically. It's not so much in like a calendar form, but you know, it's kind of like a checklist, things that I need to make sure that I do. And then, you know, writing down and keeping myself accountable for those things too. You know, my job was hard. My job is really hard. And nobody could do it like me. Nobody could talk to donors and build community like me. And that is where I really thrive. But man, sit me down in front of that outlook. Oh, it's too much. I can't do it. I tried it, you know. <laughs> um, that's not what I'm made for. And the PIP and the evaluations had a very interesting way of showing that. It never really highlighted like all of the positive and you know, great things that I contributed to the organization or to my team. And I'm over here trying to figure out what it means to have ADHD, what it means to be autistic, what it means to be, you know, majorly depressed and have PTSD in the middle of a pandemic, all while trying to keep my job. When I told you this, through tears and fear, agony and pain, you said I wasn't bringing my all because you didn't see that all I had, you took for granted. The problem woman of color, that's me, right? So a woman of color enters the organization. She is met by a panel and, you know, the panel is like in love and is supportive and, you know, wants them and is excited for everything that they have to bring. The woman of color comes into the workspace and she is, you know, meeting the expectations while simultaneously realizing that there is more to this place than meets the eye. She feels the microaggressions, she feels the tension that exists when she walks into the room. The woman of color begins to notice that things are not what they seem, more so than originally thought. So she begins to ask questions, she begins to raise concern, and the very same people who welcomed her with open arms are the ones who push her out and away trying to silence her. And instead of pushing her away, they just push her down, bury her deep, until the woman of color has no choice but to claw her way out. And the problem is, is her. And she's made to believe that she is the problem that the ideas and the thoughts and the energy that she brought when she first walked in is no longer the light that makes her glow. And she walks out, dimmed, dull, lifeless. And the cycle repeats, because when she goes, somebody else comes in. So after I left the organization, I decided that I wasn't gonna go back to work for a long time for as long as I needed. And I was gonna focus on my healing instead. I started talking to my best friend back home much more regularly. We decided like, you know, we should start a podcast. Yeah, we should start a podcast. Do you wanna? Yeah, okay, cool. So we started a podcast. <laughs> and um, it was our way of just being able to release a lot of what we've been holding in. The whole idea of the podcast grew to be a way for us to connect with other BIPOC and 
to create a community of healing and awareness to the fact that we're not alone in the struggle and we're not alone in these feelings and these this collective trauma like we're all wading through it right like we all exist within these toxic systems and some of us you know are feeling it differently some of us aren't feeling it at all but we are all a part of it this is the time in my life where i actually have the freedom to focus on my writing and to focus on my healing there are no interruptions there are no other obligations i don't have to clock in or clock out you know i'm on my own time and in my world, there's nothing but time. My name is Jay. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I really enjoy eating food. I'm very food motivated, but I also like to cook. Um, that's something that's also, has always been a big part of uh, who I am and what I do, that's what people know me for. I also really have like got into pottery. You know, like this this mug is something that I made in the my most recent what do you call it? Like a quarter. I've learned so much about myself um, through like doing this very ancient art form. Food, especially like in like this color and like this one, like some of the bright red side dishes that I eat, they just make it taste so much better, you know? So this is really cool. There was a point in my life where I couldn't really afford life. Um, and I shared with a friend that I was really struggling. And he had mentioned to me if I had ever heard of like, EBT. For those that don't know what EBT is, that's um, also known as food stamps or the SNAP program. So I went to the office um, and I went through the whole process. And after a few weeks, uh, I realized that that also wasn't enough money. And so I then went to the food banks. For me, it was like food security was very synonymous with empowerment for me. I started to become feeling more empowered in my life and also looking to just elevate where I was in life. This opportunity came up, like a friend had shared with me about this position, doing uh, community engagement around food insecurity. The organization does both food distribution um, as well as policy work. And so being involved in policy work, you work on things directly related to increasing food access, but you also work on the other things that people are, who are food insecure also facing, right? Like um, access to healthcare, um, dental care included, housing, economic opportunities. We don't have any line of communication with a large number of people who access our food programs. So that's something that I advocated for, a group of us advocated for. We would like to see a paid position at one of our locations that serves primarily um, Mandarin and Cantonese speaking elderly folks. For me, it was like, it was like very personal. You know, it's like, I see people who look just like my grandma and grandpa. And my grandma, like, she, she lived in the States for a long time, but she couldn't she barely spoke English. So who is the community built for? Is the community built only for language access, people who speak English? Or is the community built for the community that is needing services? But you, you, you can't have someone who's never experienced some shit understand that. So like, that's one thing that I've learned is like, no matter how painful it is for me and no matter how shitty it is, that white dude in power is not gonna understand it. For those of us who have been told we say too much, we are not patient enough, we do not get it, we do not know when we are the grown up versions of the very children you claim to be saving, 
say we are the grown-up versions of the very children they claim to be saving. And so I'm sharing my story about how I have the lived experience of food insecurity, but also how I really want to highlight the empowering things that happened. So like what my, what my life used to look like and then the path to where it looks like now and why I still continue to, to advocate and do things like that. This director, she asks if I can provide some photos from that point in my time when I was food insecure and going through all those rough things. This is my first interaction with this person. And so I just kind of like said, you know, I don't think I have any of those photos. Instead of saying, what are you thinking? Like, are you wanting emaciated photos of me? Would you like to see me with some charcoal on my face and like a fly like on my, on my lip or something? Like, what are you really asking me for, you know? And like, like poverty porn like was like popping up in my head. You know, look at, look at Jay who works here. He used to be super poor and now he works here. Donate to our organization. We hire people like Jay. That really resonates with me personally in the organization that I left and being, feeling very tokenized for my experiences. And to some degree, you know, like I was aware of it and I let it happen. I, I definitely was like, I'll speak at the gala. I'll let you write an article. You know, but of course I was also on staff, so I was very close to the people to be able to approve those things and, you know, let that happen in the way that I wanted to. Um, but then afterward just kind of felt like, oh yeah, they were definitely like using that up as much as they possibly could. And because there were many other instances where they asked, where they kept asking me like, why don't we just, why don't we just use Amy? Like, we can just have her speak. We can just have her share her story. We can like, have her write another blog post. And I'm just like, I'm not the only person like that's ever done these programs. And like, why is it just cause it's the easy way or just because it's like this weird savior thing where it's like, I was a student and I became an employee and now I'm doing this. Like, what is all of this about? Um, but anyway, I'm just wondering if you have thoughts around sort of the, because we've kind of gone through like the bad things, the tokenization that can happen there, but there is also a lot of value in bringing on someone having employees with lived experience, which is a lot of what you're talking about with hiring new staff, um, not only bilingual staff, but people that can really build community in those ways. So your thoughts around all of that. I think getting more people with lived experience not only means that as people with lived experience of like racism, poverty, it's also you're getting people with lived experience who have been tokenized. You're getting more of those people who can speak about that, right? And so the more we talk about it, the more we share about it, the more we learn about it, the more we know about it, the more we can like take that shit down. When nonprofits say community, what they mean is picture for a poster. When we say community, what we mean is, is a child whose mother I know. That we are not interested in saving, but helping them see themselves as worthy of more than a speech at a fundraiser. Say we. I started following this potter who was making like these really cool things. Then one day they had posted that they were offering free classes for black indigenous people of color. And I just thought, maybe I just, I would just go in to like meet this person, this, this potter, and then just also find out about how hard this is and then that'll be it. And I showed up and I felt welcomed. I felt right in that space. The teacher shares very openly about their, the racism and the different isms that that they face in life and so it's become a space since day one where like you can talk about that and also laugh about it you know like i was telling that i was telling my teacher uh like two weeks ago i was like yo did i ever tell you the story about this 
this communications director that we had. And they're like, no, like, what about it? And I tell them the story about how they asked me for a photo from that sad, hard time in my life. And I asked them, like, if you heard it, would you have kind of heard that as like, can you send me like a, like an emaciated photo of yourself? And the teacher just started laughing and was like, oh my God, they probably were like, hope, probably wanted to like ask you if they could Photoshop like a fly on your face and like put charcoal on your face. And just like, really, we just kept going deep and deep into like what it's like, what would make that photo more and more exciting for that person, for that communications director. And I think that like, it just goes into, that's part of also like, it's a, a tool that we use to, to deal with the bullshit, but also it's like a tool of resiliency to be able to like laugh about those things and clown on it. I hadn't laughed that hard in so long. Like I was crying in class and um, my teacher's glasses were completely fogged from all the laughing and like crying that we were doing while just going off about that, that part of my life that was like really harmful, but we were able to like laugh about it. Some days I don't come out with a single thing that's thrown because my headspace, but then I leave it. Like I leave class just feeling better about my day. I think some kind of like stuff fires off in my brain. I'm already excited about it. Like, yo, this is, you know, this is kimchi that my mother made, right? And it's inside of a side dish that like I've made and damn, look how beautiful that looks. And like, mm, you know, it's so beautiful and tastes so good. <laughs>is Gabrielle Oglesby, but I go by Gabby. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, or they, them, and I've been working in nonprofits for about a decade. I would say I come from a family of helpers, and uh, my dad's a social worker. Uh, my mom's an office manager, more in corporate, but I've always seen her show up in, in really helpful ways and supportive ways. And I felt in myself that I always really value just being in relationship and being in supportive uh, dynamics. Um, I think just naturally being of service was something that I, I wanted to do. Um, and it felt more aligned in terms of like purpose um, that I feel like I have. So yeah, looking for jobs, I, I was never attracted to corporate or anything in the business world, although I like entertained it for a little while, because it's like, right, you think about money, you think about success as I thought about it then, and I considered that route, but then it, it never did anything for me in terms of like my heart um, and feeling passionate about things. I'm a very passionate, caring, thoughtful person. And so being able to channel that into the work that I do was important because I need to feel that sense of alignment. So I think that's what that's what brought me there. So I, I wanted to do Peace for Peace Corps for a long time. Um, I think because it checked a few different boxes for me. One, um, you know, wanting to be of service. Two, really having you know interest in doing work and being abroad, and specifically um, on the continent, you know, mother motherland of Africa. And so I got accepted um, to serve in the Kingdom of Eswatini or formerly known as Swaziland as a youth development volunteer. And for those who aren't familiar, like Swaziland has one of the highest or the highest HIV prevalence in the world at 24 to 26% uh, percent of their population is HIV positive. And so the, the work would be going there to engage youth in empowerment work, um, doing clubs, you know, having conversations with them around sexual reproductive health education, uh, life skills. I know English was a big piece of their learning as well. Um, so all of that really appeased to me and the idea of 
Being able to like dial things back a little bit because we have this American culture and society that's very almost external. And so I wanted a, an opportunity to be internal and come back to like what I need and simplicity, you know, and learning and exchanging, you know, ideas with another culture really, really appeased to me. So much of what is asked of you is to complete these projects and everything is centered around projects and numbers, right? So it, it's sort of, yes, the value of the relationship, they, it, they speak of it, but it doesn't seem like that is what the most valuable thing is, if that makes any sense. Um, and so I, I, I think, it, yeah, it gets really conflated when it's like, yeah, I wanna know you and I want you to know me, but what about this project though? You know, but we gotta get things done and there's a time limit, I'm only here two years, you know? So that's very much, that was always in the backdrop. And to me is what made the work feel really icky at times, was like an ulterior motive in a sense, as opposed to like, what if we just went somewhere? You know, yes, they invited us, um, but literally just to build relationship and be in relationship and learn from each other and be with each other and witness each other. You know, how powerful that would have felt as opposed to you need to do X, Y, and Z. And I think because of the relationship locals had with um, missionaries, with uh, NGOs, with other nonprofits who have been in their country, they do see them as, sa as saviors. And so there is this complex that already exists. And so for us to come in and further that, it did not feel, it didn't feel good. And I, I remember like a year into my service, having this moment of reckoning, like, what am I doing here? Is this causing more harm? You know, because I think being an American, even though I was a black American, there's still, you know, there's still that sense of power over, if you will. Um, and, you know, so then I just started asking people I was close to in the community, like, is it helpful for me to be here? You know, I, I am having these conflicting feelings. And of course they all said yes, but I also have to take into consideration their own relationship with, again, like with colonization with these other NGOs and the message that they've been receiving year after year about really like them not being capable or able to sustain or do what they need to do for themselves and people think it's you know it's it's up to them and it's only it's only you know their responsibility to make sure that they can help these people as if they haven't been helping themselves for centuries you know so it's it's very it's very stark um, and problematic. <sighs> yeah, I, I wanna say more, but I'm having trouble like formulating. It's a very visceral experience, <laughs> um, witnessing, you know, saviorism in, in, in action. When nonprofit says nonprofit, nonprofit means nothing that truly makes change. Nonprofit means I must sacrifice myself to prove our commitment to people who know my commitment so that nonprofit can co-opt my commitment for its mission statement. When nonprofit says nonprofit, nonprofit means we gain nothing and nonprofit gains a shiny white badge of complicit for its annual report. Say complicit. You know, during my time there, I did a lot of work uh, with women specifically around harm and violence that they had experienced and sort of grew an affinity for wanting to do more work specifically around that and working within the gender-based violence movement. And so I started looking here and ended up getting um, the job that I have now, which is a supervising manager at a domestic violence nonprofit, um, and the program is called Survivor Advocacy Services. I think also taking into account a lot of our staff are survivors, right? And a lot of them are BIPOC. Um, some have disabilities. Like we have people with very intersectional identities, and so to ask people who are already being harmed by systems to be involved in a system that's continuing to perpetuate harm by overworking them and underpaying them. Um, it's just twi you know, twice as much harm. And then not giving them the time or space to like rest um, their bodies and their spirits and heal because the work that they're doing is very heart heavy. 
Um, it's just a disservice to everyone involved. I started to see these patterns happening within our staff, within myself, where it was like you're just, you're just working endlessly and there doesn't seem to be you know, any support sort of built in for the work that you're doing and the labor that you're putting in. And so I ended up forming a meditation space for the staff. Um, and so that was just happening once a week for about 30 to 45 minutes where I would bring folks in because at the time too, I was just being introduced to meditation and yoga. And so I'm like, oh my goodness, like this is, these practices are amazing, at least for me in terms of like regulating um, and managing my emotions and stress. And so I wanted to just bring that and offer that to my colleagues as well. Is that sustainable? No. Like <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> I'm very tired. I'm very, very tired. Because um, there is a huge emotional burden on my back and has been forever and ever, but especially in this role, um, to be supporting people the way that I do, because I, I want to I wanna hold the whole human, you know, and value the whole human, and that's a lot of labor. Um, and it's only now that my agency is recognizing, and I think because of the pandemic, it's truly exposed the unsustainability of like how we've been doing things. Um, but it's only now that it started to become a collective effort. I got into healing through my own healing journey and process, which started around 10 years ago. I was a dancer as well for a long time and loved to dance and just move my body. And so that that was something that I was looking for in terms of like what I was gonna anchor myself in as I started this healing process. And then I found yoga um, at a gym that I was going to at the time. And so I started going just periodically, like never too intense. But I was like, I don't know what this is, but like, it, this is cool. Like I like it, it reminded me of ballet, which was the type of dance I was trained in. Um, but I love that it integrated breath. And the teacher would just say these really like profound spiritual things. And up until that point, I hadn't had any spirituality um, in my, you know, in my care. And so that was something that really appealed to me. So my style of dance is like a mix of ballet, belly dance, um, I'm West Indian, so in the Caribbean, like you wind your waist. Um, so there's a combination of that and like Afro dance. And yeah, I would think that's how I would, I would describe it. <laughs> it's a hodgepodge, but it's very beautiful and it feel, it's very cathartic for me as well. Yeah. as a consultant I started my own consulting business where I am mostly focused on um, what I say is organizational culture and operationalizing equity so having a real focus on inclusion and employee happiness I think one of the things that I noticed a lot in my past nonprofit experiences was um, you know, the cognitive dissonance and the real um, mismatch between what orgs were saying their values were, how they were expressing them externally and internally, and how those things weren't matching. And then other than that, uh, I actually have been really trying to focus on not working that much and just resting and healing and um, yeah, just trying to work again on, on how I live. <laughs> so what I'm trying to tell nonprofits that they should do, I'm also working on doing those things myself, like not overworking, not getting to a burnout place and just trying to take care of myself and be healthy and be in community.
So many people come to nonprofit work because they're passionate about it. They love their cause. They want to help children. They want to help the environment. They want to help animals. They have a passion for changing the world and improving, improving the conditions in which we live. Um, and that's often exploited and, and told to them, um, you're, you're, what you're getting out of this job is a fulfillment of your passion. So you don't need as much money. You don't need benefits. Um, you can overwork yourself. You can put in all this extra time because what you're getting out of it is fulfilling your passion. Um, and that's not, that's not fair. We can, <laughs> we can care about something and still want to be paid a living wage and want to have boundaries and work only a specific amount of time. It was really touching to me when that article came out that I wrote for CCF and there were so many people reaching out to me saying they felt like they weren't alone and they felt like everything I said really resonated and I loved that and I also it also broke my heart because I knew so many other people were going through these terrible things that I was going through. So to me, I really wanted to focus on on culture and to change that so turn so we could like lower turnover so people could be happier in their jobs and and then I thought maybe that could be how we made a difference. <laughs> One person in particular, a really good friend of mine and I decided to put in our notice on the same day. Um, so we chose on our own to leave. Um, and we gave two weeks notice. We didn't, I didn't think we did anything too radical. Um, we just said we, we wanted to leave, we weren't happy. What ended up happening was they didn't want my two weeks. <laughs> they stripped me of my passwords, brought a box to me, made me box up my desk and uh, took my keys and fully escorted me from the building. Um, I had never been treated like that ever before. And it took me a really long time to realize they were they were treating me as if I was dangerous to them um, because I was. <laughs> um, because the ideas that I was holding and the change that I represented was really dangerous to them. And they didn't want me spreading my thoughts or ideas to anyone else. While I am a consultant and I am benefiting from <laughs> a culture where consultants are valued, I think it's just as silly as everything else. Like, I think, just how I think people in nonprofits and foundations should be working themselves out of a job, I think consultants should be doing the same thing. <laughs> and um, what I mean specifically is that there's this culture within nonprofits where they don't listen to employees. Um, there's so many good ideas, so many changes can be made from within if they actually just, you know, changed hierarchy structures, <laughs> if they just gave power to different people, if they actually just listened. Um, but because they won't do that, they then instead decide to bring in an external consultant <laughs> who uh, can fix all the problems. And basically for me, I just listen to the employees um, and I just end up being the person who can be listened to by leadership. And I'll be really clear, like, here's what I've heard from staff and here's ways that you can listen to staff in the future. And here's how we put systems in place so that I don't need to be around forever so that staff feel comfortable giving feedback um, and that you can listen to it without a consultant. I had a professor in grad school um, that this will always stick with me. Professor Marlowe said, nonprofit is a tax status, not a business model. And that means that in order to survive, nonprofits still need to make a profit. They still really aim to be profitable, to have savings, to have investments. In order to make that profit, they're having to seek donations from people who want to have opinions and input on how the organization is operating um, and having that what we call in the fundraising side of donor centrism where they're centering everything they're doing on the donor can really change what the organization is about it makes them scared to make changes to be radical because they would have to sell that to donors and wealthy people donors are still part of our community but they're not 
the main thing that we want at the center um, because it's not their needs that need to be focused on. It's the needs of our community that we're trying to improve and that have that have been harmed by systems of oppression over generations and generations. By focusing just on donors, we're not doing what's best for our communities. I'm uh, Jalen Scott, executive director of a legal and social services organization. Um, she, her pronouns. Oftentimes, like in black community, like grandmothers will just grab you and just say like, look, look, you're called to the ministry. That's what you're gonna do. And so I had that, but I also had an internal call um, to do something within religion and the spiritual realm. To be honest, uh, Christian ministry never fit, never made sense to me. And not only because of my queer and trans identity, but it just, there was something not quite right about it. And, um, but I knew that there was some sort of uh, leadership or something in my future. A friend of mine mentioned this book by Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, Living Buddha, Living Christ. And I read it and I was like, there's something there, right? There's something in the essence of Christianity that I was seeing in Buddhism. And so I began to practice and I went to this retreat center, back to that in um, Northern Mississippi. And there was a Kuan Yin uh, statue. And I sat in front of that statue and I was filled with the Holy Ghost right there. And it had nothing to do with Christ, the black church, any of that, but it was the exact same feeling, the exact same possession. I was overwhelmed. Something took over my body, took over my spirit. And I knew that those two things were different. And I knew there was a different way for me to tap into my faith and to express my faith. There was this path for religious education and ministry of religious education. And it opened in a Unitarian church. I felt called to Unitarian Universalism because of who they say they are, right? And who they say they are is someone who can take me and all of my different faith orientations with all of my history um, and with all my queerness and transness and accept me um, as a leader and as a, a, a sibling. Then you see behind the curtain, right? Um, and I think that's with any nonprofit, there's the, the mission that we're seeing on the outside and then you see the inside and non and, and faith organizations are very much completely enmeshed in the nonprofit industrial complex. Um, and they suffer all of the issues that other nonprofits suffer, which is given, first of all, just given too big of a mission. Conservative America has placed uh, social services on faith organizations versus doing what I think the government should be doing itself. And so it's given way too big of a mission. And on the other side of that, even worse than secular nonprofits, they are often exempt from a lot of the scrutiny that other nonprofits have because of religious freedom. The reality on the ground is there has always been a conflict with people of color in these mostly white liberal organizations, including the Unitarian Universalist Church. There had always been one or two people who made my life a living hell. And I think, you know, I find that even in secular nonprofits, it's the same thing. There's one or two people who um, are malicious in their intent to tear Black leadership down, Black fan leadership down, Black trans and queer leadership down. And it comes through emails. It comes through... Um, uh, doubting, sometimes it's just directly nasty words said, right? It's come, It comes to dismissal of who I am to just the color of my skin and so on. And the institution itself provides no protection from that and allows it to run amok. And so they are always more protective of those voices, even if they're malicious voices, but the voices of those who are in the majority, mostly white, oftentimes women, um, in these nonprofits and in these congregations. 
it's even now hard for me to to read about faith and to practice you know in my own buddhist tradition because they just really massacred my um my love of 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 the divine and so um i couldn't do that work anymore and so i was hoping to enter sort of this situation where i could take the best of what I've learned in, in, in terms of operations and human resources, management of people, the this, this special mix that happens within a, a 501c3, um, and bring that to a secular organization. So I enter secular nonprofit work um, at, in human resources and operations. I think there was consensus uh, among the staff that we were heading in the right direction. And there was a consensus that I should move into executive directorship. The board agreed. It's interesting to watch how the relationship changed radically uh, with staff, just with the title. It, I became the embodiment of all of those things that I uh, came in to fix and to change. No matter how, how you know, I just landed in the position, but where else are people going to put the the blame except where power now is. It really broke my heart to see the same thing happen that I've seen, you know, when I was at congregations um, and elsewhere, that my identity became um, a place of attack and vulnerability. Although I really had nothing to do with why the system was what it was, because I had just landed. Now I would say our current staff is a, it's, it's a different ball game. We are now working together in a very particular way and we worked through a lot of pain and a lot of trauma. And now we need to figure out how to actually um, live and live fully and support others to live and live fully in the workplace. Um, so I, what we've tried to do is to create a workspace that feels like this sort of beautiful, creative, feminist space that I was used to growing up with my family, with my mother and grandmothers and aunts, right? In that space and create a workspace around that. So that means people can bring themselves fully and their full identities. It means that we are very direct with each other, that we cut through passive aggressiveness. And it means that we care for each other, not using traditional workspace as a guide for how we care for each other, but using our Afro and indigenous and Latinx roots to figure out how we actually really should care for each other. It, it may not survive because of the system that it's in and because it's still a 501c3, um, but it, there's something beautiful that I feel like has some, potential, some potentiality there. Where is the spreadsheet that proves my production paid in pennies in sacrifice, in meetings that could have been emails, in swallowing my shame from white women's carelessness, from able-bodied bliss, from men's needless philosophies, from cis resistance to be told anything about themselves. Because someone had the time, the expensive education, the double income, the privilege, the privilege, the privilege to get pregnant again. Say privilege. For those of us who want nothing more than for anyone at a staff meeting to stop fucking talking about themselves for two minutes to notice what it takes for some of us to get to this table that you did not build for us to be at, but here we are anyway. Remember, this whole system was never meant for us to survive it. Say, this whole system was never meant for us to survive it. I am not sure if I will survive this. I am exhausted. I have um, uh, new um, conditions happening. You know, my diabetes has like onset of diabetes since nonprofit. Um, a recent diagnosis of high blood pressure. I'm really questioning whether or not this is gonna take me out. And it is the stress because nothing else has changed. And no one, no one in my family has had this problem this early. So the stress itself can either completely take my body out or I can be smart and at some, so, at some point self-select out. I, I'm not sure I will 
I know I won't survive as executive director for long. I'm not sure I'm gonna survive the thing, period, you know? And so what I am truly hoping and what I'm truly having a lot of faith in is that I'm given this sort of last, um, this, uh, this sort of last push, um, this last little bit of effort to see if this new organizing structure led by Black trans femmes and Black trans women really centered around Black and Indigenous and feminist and womanist ways of being, whether or not that's a, a way that that I can actually exist in this and survive and renew myself. Uh, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we'll get there. My name is Ibo Barton. I use they, them, or he, him pronouns. I'm the director of housing services at a trans advocacy nonprofit. I'm an independent artist and I'm a full-time student. Like most folks that enter the military, I entered the military because of a lot of big promises uh, of, of security, of you know finance, financial security, et cetera. Um, and what was conditioned in me in the military um, was that obedience is sort of the way, like hierarchy is sort of the way and the system and how we're supposed to live. I was a culinary specialist in the Navy, so um, I had a lot of kitchen experience. Um, so that led me to being a chef um, after being separated from the military. And I think that that sort of, uh, in the, in the military sort of informed how I would exist in a kitchen, which is very similar, which has very hierarchical structure. Um, you know, there's a front house and back of house. Um, there is line cooks and cooks that are more important than line cooks and prep cooks, etc. Um, and there was sort of this commander, which is the head chef. So it, it sort of fell in line to the lifestyle I was already conditioned to live in. So it made sense. Um, but what ended up happening for me is that I uh, experienced spoken word poetry and poetry slam and became part of this giant community of arts in Seattle, specifically with BIPOC artists, that led me into working into the nonprofit um, industrial complex. There was a large percentage of people of color on staff. Um, I've never I've never heard any issues with this organization, right? Like I'm thinking of all this magical stuff. They do art. I get to do art full, you know, for all of my my time. Um, and what I ended up discovering as I got into that organization is the separation of, um, you know, white folks in higher positions, um, especially dealing with finances and money. Um, there were a lot of folks of color that were on the ground um, and in that, you know, manager, what is the word that they use in nonprofit, coordinator um, positions um, and never rising out of that and either leaving um, before they could ever get to a director position or um, just never wanting to in that particular system. A lot of the directors were never even there for us to ask questions of. There was no training. Uh, a lot of our supervisors weren't trained in the, in the particular programs that we were running, right? So we were kind of just uh, these little silos uh, that had our own situations going on with no support from anyone else. In nonprofits, we believe that, um, that we're doing social justice work. And we fail to recognize, and we're so busy showing everyone else what they're doing wrong and how to fix it and how to be more inclusive and all of that, that we forget that with, even within ourselves and within our own system, that we're um, perpetuating all of the different harms in micro versions of that in the organization. There are folks of color that are still invested in maintaining white supremacy, even subconsciously. There's also this idea that um, this person's well-intentioned and so white supremacy doesn't exist in their body, which is just not true. Um, and I think that there's a new trend of giving uh, people of color positions of power um, because they're people of color and nothing else. Um, and, and while, you know, people can argue that that's illegal, um, you do eventually have to interview the person, right? 
Um, and as long as they have the the base set of structure of skills that you need, then they're the perfect person. And that what ends up happening is because it's sort of this, um, we want you to succeed in terms of like, look who we hired, but they don't want you to succeed because they won't give you support. They won't give you training. They won't, you know, like they won't do all of these things. And so you're sort of expected to fail or everybody's waiting for you to fail in these ways. Or because you're given this job, you're doing everything you can to protect that you have it because you'll never get it again, right? And so that put, pits us against each other um, in which um, folks of color that are in leadership positions are often the ones causing harm because they either wanna keep the job that they have because they're afraid that they'll never get that opportunity ever again, or because they're trying to defend their poor choices because they were never trained to do the, the position to begin with. There's this concept happening over and over and over again where um, white folks in power are like, well, we did our job. We hired the person of color, right? Um, when that person was, wasn't either set up, doesn't have the right mindset, doesn't have the right analysis, um, you know, like, or has isn't part of the community in a way that's going to help them. I think power is something that we're we don't identify in all of these dis different situations in which folks are given power in ways that they've never been given power before, and um, we always have to ask the question of how we're wielding it, right? And um, that's not a question that's being asked ever. <laughs> when you go home and the lights don't turn on. The fear is that the bill has gone unpaid for too long. When you make sure to pack unseasoned and mediocre food from a potluck retreat with no results, the fear is that this is all you will eat until payday and still come up empty. We were in conversation to restructure the organization. So there was the board, the executive director, the uh, leadership, and then there was all of us that were coordinators, managers, whatever you want to call them. And I think that there was, a, um, because of the hierarchy, the message that we were sending up was not the message that we were originally had wrote, right? So we decided as a group that we should write a letter to the board from all of us about our experiences and bypass the leadership because they weren't getting the message correctly. My coworker and I were, were sitting at a bar along with, I believe there was another coworker there with us in which we were all processing in the first place our experiences with the organization to where I got this idea to write this letter. Um, and so we wrote the, you know, we were writing the letter with the computer out at the bar, sort of like, you know, um, brainstorming all the different ways in which we would do this. And we called and texted, we had, we were on a text thread with the entire staff um, or the, the on the ground staff. And uh, we asked for folks to uh, not only sign the letter, but also initial and sort of stand by things that we've witnessed that were being um, they were being told in this letter, um, which they did. And this all happened within hours. Um, and that I was shocked because it was this Google document and folks were in there immediately as soon as I sent the link and it got done, right? And that was the most enthusiastic I've ever seen that staff before. So clearly there is something wrong that needed to be fixed within the organization. This was met with a lot of silence at first, um, like extreme silence. There were no, thank you for sending the emails. There were no, um, you know, responses, and it wasn't until about two weeks later, or maybe a week later, um, that uh, the president of the board was sort of like, we got it, and we're having a conversation about it. There was nothing else about it, and everything started to dwindle and avalanche and snowball from there, in which um, I was terminated along with my coworker, and then there was sort of this mass exodus <laughs> from the organization afterwards because of the, the treatment that we received. You know, like if 12 of my staff members, if I had an organization and 12 of my staff members left because of something I did, wouldn't I pause and say, what are we doing? Right, like what, what am I doing? What is my responsibility to this? Instead of, um, you know, building up walls and being like, well, all, all of those people were wrong <laughs> and I am not. Like what kind of uh, self-involved criticism is that of other people? I work at a nonprofit now and I feel very comfortable and safe in the position that I'm in um, with my coworkers, with the leadership that's there. I also feel a sense of security being surrounded by black trans people um, and doing work for black trans people um, where I can see the actual through line to how my work 
gets to um, black trans community, right? And I think that that was a piece that was missing in a lot of my other positions that I've held, um, is that I'm not knowing what the actual impact is or what my work is doing or who it's being sold to or whatever the case may be. I'm still healing from that harm, I will say. Um, I think that, again, like I, there are certain switches that I have to turn on and off for work right now um, that I'm definitely still working through. I think one of the biggest uh, things that I was able to receive from this experience is that I wrote an entire book that dealt with some of the experiences that I had during that time and all of the different aspects of my life that informed some of the ways I was existing in that organization. Insubordinate was born out of um, being terminated from a previous nonprofit organization. Um, and insubordinate was something that I was called uh, while um, on my way out of that organization. Um, and so what I sort of wanted to do was take that word and, uh, and ask everyone else, what does it mean to be insubordinate? And what I've discovered is that insubordinate is just like diversity. It depends on who's talking and who is the the power that is make, is calling me insubordinate, right? Um, so, and what I what I came to was that in so if we're gonna do this social justice work, isn't all the work we do insubordinate? Um, like, isn't isn't my existence insubordinate? And it opens with um, a litany for not surviving nonprofits, which I got, uh, which is inspired by Andre Lord's um, litany for survival that particular poem spoke to me so much because it's sort of this like um, we settle in to our our survival and so we don't even know often especially as nonprofit staff members that we're experiencing all of this oppression and we're you know we're dealing with all of this bs and we sort of settle into like oh okay well i guess this is just it and all the while knowing that there was never a plan for you to survive. There was never a plan for you to rise up. There was never a plan. You were the person that was supposed to come in, do this work that we needed to get done and move on. There was never um, this idea that you were supposed to rise up and be a leader in this place. When you finally speak up, if you choose to do so, and you are tagged insubordinate, as if insubordinate isn't what you are made of. When you are black, you are insubordinate. When you are non-binary, you are insubordinate. When you are queer, you are insubordinate. When you're an educator, you are insubordinate. When you are loved, you are insubordinate. When you are broke, you are insubordinate. Say to whom? And you are forced to resign, quit quietly, stop showing up, terminated. Remember, this whole system was never meant for us to survive it. If you think about it, we've had this sector for what, at least 150 years. And if it was a system that was really working to improve the lives of people and communities, um, it wouldn't still exist. You know, this was like a charitable thing for people who had the money and resources and time, you know, and now it's it's a thing a lot of people want to be involved in because it's it's in alignment with things that they care about or are passionate about or directly impact them or their communities. Um, and so I think that means we have to take a hard look at how we're doing things, um, especially, you know, bringing in people who have lived experiences, we need to really be cognizant of those and how we are providing care for them as they're providing care for other people. You know, and I think taking, you know, taking a healing justice approach to the work, you know, where we're, engage we're engaging people in, in, in healing um, as a form of justice.
We want to see shared power. We want to see horizontal power structures. We want to see that in pay equity, not just in like, you can't just give me more power but not more money. You can't give me more responsibility and not more money. If you're not going to do that, if you're not going to be down with eliminating that hierarchical system, well then you better get some thick skin. You better be down for feedback. You better be down for accountability. Not only accountability, you better be down for the accountability on the accountability when we recheck. And that just doesn't exist. We're so driven in that external mission because for fundraising purpose and purposes and etc. But I think it's important that we spend that same amount of energy, not necessarily for fundraising purposes or to promote the organization or its survival, but to promote the survival of the members of the org, especially when you bring in Black folks, especially when you bring in Black gender diverse people. Like there needs to be a time, it's almost more of a commitment to your employees than the mission itself. And I think that's a radical shift. And it's also scary. And you have to let go of this concern for the survival of your org and really the survival of your own position. Um, you're more committed to the livelihood of the people you see every single day than you are to this abstract thing. There were a lot of problems with the definition of the word equity. And I think that this is a commonplace problem in all organizations, specifically in Seattle, where we have this idea of what we think equity is. We also have our personal values of what equity is. And then there's also this public image that we have to uh, play in terms of equity. And I think all of that gets jumbled to where the individuals working for that organization, their personal values around equity are what people are actually investing in and not the org's definition. So I think it's important for orgs to define that word as it means to the organization and how you have to do business. And that's what you put in your values and not this like dreamy whatever um, thing that they're putting on their websites to draw people in. Because what ends up happening is that everyone then relies on the individual person that showed them what equity meant um, and when the organization fails to do that specific thing then um, that's when they get called out or that's when the organization starts to crumble um, because there's not this foundation of what equity could mean. I think that in any system I think that it needs to fall completely, uh, turn to dust and then we can all decide if we want to rebuild it or rebuild something new. One year of equity training isn't going to destroy white supremacy. It's not going to change the power dynamics and the microaggressions that happen every day. But what it is going to do is it's going to prepare people. It's going to help people better understand these systems and better, or just even naming these systems and creating that common language and creating the understanding that these harmful systems exist and we are also responsible with dismantling them as we exist in them. Um, and a lot of organizations, especially the nonprofit industrial complex, don't want to move towards that because they don't want to relinquish that power. They're not ready for that yet.
I think the industry itself needs to feel the burn that this will not continue or we will tear it down. One of the things that I, I do want to ask folks is what are you willing to sacrifice for the sake of equity? And I think that that is the biggest question um, that nonprofit staff should ask themselves, right? So what position are you holding? Are you willing to sacrifice that position for equity? Or are you a believer in equity because it gets you more funding? I strongly believe that the most powerful force in the organization is the staff. And if you are not taking care of your staff, if you are not looking out for your staff, then what are you even doing? I believe that we all have a place in fighting for equity, fighting for change in our world, and um, this song is about being that change. This is called Be Change. I don't ever want to be the same. I want to be change. I want to be change. After we fight, we win, and still more work remains. I want to be change. I want to be change. Something that's been missing for me A reason to believe when nobody is free Land of the incarceration, colonization, white supremacy That ain't liberation to me I don't ever want to be the same I want to be changed, I want to be changed After we fight and we win and still more work remains I want to be changed I want to be changed Have we lost sight of the American dream? We know the system is broken, it never worked for us anyway. Just look at the racism, sexism, big corporations ruling everything. More like the American scheme. to be changed.